The regular season is winding down to a close 25 races over almost 30 weeks, and it all comes down to the Brickyard Sunday. Only 16 drivers can make the playoffs. Who's going to be in? Who's going to be out? We're going to talk about all that great stuff in today's episode. How's it going, you guys? My name is Eric, and welcome to Out of the Groove. Yes, we're finally out of the car and into a studio. It's still a work in progress. I still gotta work on a few things, so if there's, a, you know, the lighting's a little weird, I gotta add some lights, I gotta maybe add some echo reducing stuff to the walls a little bit. I don't know how the audio is gonna sound, hopefully it sounds all right. But as far as the decor, we're making some pretty good progress, so yeah, I'm finally out of the car, hopefully for pretty much the rest of 2019, so. There we go. But you guys don't want to hear me talk about all that. It's pretty boring stuff. But we're here today to talk instead about Indianapolis Motor Speedway. This has become one of the most polarizing racetracks in all of NASCAR. Maybe the most polarizing. Some fans love it because it's technically a crown jewel for NASCAR, the Brickyard 400, and it's at probably the most famous racetrack in the entire freaking world, so it's great for all those reasons. But other fans don't like it because historically the racing at Indianapolis hasn't always been the best. We've had some major issues there, like, what, a decade ago, the tire debacle at Indianapolis. You know, we've had some real stinkers at Indy, and the shrinking attendance at that track has definitely proven that. You know, 10 years ago, almost 250,000 people were going to this race. It rivaled the Indy 500 in terms of popularity. Nowadays, it does not. They are getting maybe a quarter of that at best. It's no secret NASCAR attendance has dipped across the board in the last 10, 15 years, but no track has been hit harder by this than Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Like I said, this track used to sell 200,000 tickets for the NASCAR race. Now it's selling a quarter of that at best, and it's insane to really see how badly things have dropped off over there. Because the Indianapolis 500 for IndyCar every year still sells out pretty much. They still get a quarter million people there at least every single year. So there's still race fans that are interested in coming to Indianapolis Motor Speedway. They're just not interested in coming there for stock cars. And that's what the last few years have really shown. So the racing hasn't been very good recently. The attendance has dropped off significantly. NASCAR doesn't know where to put it in the schedule. They keep bumping it from middle of the summer to this year it's the last race of the regular season, which I think is kind of fun, adds some drama to it. Can't find a good place for it in the schedule. So there's a lot of people asking the very honest question, should NASCAR keep racing at the famed Indianapolis Motor Speedway? Or has this whole experiment kind of run its course? It's been going for a couple decades. I want to present both sides of this argument because I think a lot of people actually have very strong opinions about this. And I think both arguments, yay or nay, in this, in this case, are very valid and I think deserve to be explored a little bit. Uh, after I talk about this, I'll talk about the actual playoff cut line. We'll look at the big names, the drivers on the cut line coming into this race, but I want to just talk about Indy as a track for a moment. So with all the negatives around Indianapolis that I've kind of talked about already, there are some positives to it. Here's a tweet from Adam Stern over at Sports Business Journal earlier this week. He says that ticket sales for the Indianapolis Brickyard 400 this weekend are looking to be about the same as last year. Indianapolis is estimating around 50,000 people will be in attendance for the Brickyard 400, which knowing that Indianapolis seats 250,000, it's going to look weird when on the grandstands are only a fifth full. That's going to look bad. But I want to note this important detail. Darlington Raceway this last weekend, you guys saw the fit photos. We saw the race. It was a packed house. There was not an empty seat in those grandstands. Looked beautiful. Looked like NASCAR in its heyday again. But Darlington Raceway only seats 47,000. So basically, we're going to see the same crowd at Indianapolis this weekend that we saw at Darlington last weekend, as far as the size goes at least. Darlington drew about 50,000. They're saying Indy's going to draw about 50,000 people. So we all called the Darlington race a huge success because we got 50,000 people there. Why is Indianapolis considered a failure for only bringing 50,000 people in there? Is it just because they have all these more seats and it looks worse on TV because there's more spots in the stands and everything? I mean, obviously, yeah, that is the reason. I guess that was a rhetorical question. But a lot of people continue to bash Indianapolis. It says nobody's going there. Nobody's going to that race. It's a failing race. Just, just take it off the schedule. But it's still pulling in as many, if not more, fans than Darlington did this last weekend. And Darlington's right there in South Carolina, the heart of NASCAR country. It's another crown jewel race. It's now been amplified even more with the throwback theming. I don't know. Is Indianapolis really a failure if it's still bringing in more people than Darlington? The TV ratings for Indianapolis are always good because often NBC or whoever's carrying the race each year typically tries to put it on their main network. Uh, so typically Indianapolis, the 400, has very strong ratings. I don't know why. I think people just tune in because it's Indianapolis and maybe some people thought it was the Indy 500 and tuned in thinking it was going to be IndyCars and maybe that's all it is. But still, 
there is still more buzz around the Brickyard 400 than there is at your average NASCAR Cup Series race weekend, and I think that deserves to be noted. I know it's dropped off substantially. 10, 15 years ago, the Brickyard 400 was almost as big as the Daytona 500 in many, many ways. Obviously, it's dropped off substantially, and if it continues to drop off at the rate it has been the last few years, then sure, in a few years, yeah, we should probably get Indianapolis off the schedule, because at that point, there'll probably only be 20,000 people going to the races, and NBC won't want to put it on NBC anymore. It'll be on NBCSN. At that point, yeah, maybe Indy needs to be taken off, but people are talking about this now because with 2021 looming and a lot of people talking about major schedule changes, some people I think are hoping or thinking that NASCAR should take Indy off the schedule in 2021. I fear that might be jumping the gun just a little bit. Look, I'm not a big Indianapolis Motor Speedway fan, at least not when it comes to NASCAR. I went to Indianapolis uh, in 2007 for the Brickyard 400, and I can easily say that was my least favorite race I've gone to in person. <laughs> I sat on the front stretch, and I don't like that you can only see a third of the racetrack. I like going to Texas or Bristol or, you know, the other oval tracks where you can see all the way around, or you can, there's plenty of different types of views at Indianapolis. Unless you're sitting in the corners, the most amount of the track you can see is like a third of it. So I don't like that about the Indianapolis in-person experience, and with the race being running like July in recent years, I have no, I, I, I have no question why people weren't going to that race. Is Indy declining? Yes, but has it declined yet to a point where NASCAR should immediately be looking for a replacement on the schedule? No, it has not. And I know there's a lot of indie haters out there that might be sad to hear that, might be sad to know that it's still going to draw more fans out than uh, Darlington did, but it's just the truth, unfortunately. Darl or Indianapolis Motor Speedway is still such a historic, such a weighted name that people are going to show up. If it's got Indianapolis or the Brickyard in the name, race fans are going to tune in. At least a lot of them are. And that's just the truth of it. I don't think NASCAR should be looking to get away from Indianapolis Motor Speedway anytime soon. They got the road course there that maybe would be cool for them to run instead at some point. But... Unfortunately, I don't think NASCAR has any incentive to move away from the Brickyard in the next couple of years. Five, ten years down the line, maybe a completely different story, but not yet now. I think it'd be jumping the gun if they took Indianapolis off the schedule completely in 2021. I think that would be a little, a little nuts. Now next year, they are moving this race back to July, which I think some people question. Some people, I think, see the merit in. I think it's a hit or miss. Obviously, moving back to July is going to be really hot, which is part of the reason they moved it to September in the first place, so that's a little questionable. But they are moving it to the 4th of July race weekend, which is going to be huge, I think, for that track. That's going to give them a lot of stuff to work with, and I think a lot of fans are going to be excited to celebrate you know, Independence Day at one of the most historic sporting facilities in the entire world. Uh, maybe the most historic sporting facility in America. I mean, the Indy 500, but 250, 300,000 people there is the biggest sporting event in America. So, hey, go patriotic, go crazy. But we'll see what the future for Indianapolis holds. Uh, talking about the very near future, though, we've got the final regular season race in just a few days, and there are some big, big names right there on the cut line. It's the same four or five names we've been talking about for a while now because they continue to flip-flop, go back and forth. It's wild, it's crazy, but I'm going to give you guys the lowdown going into the Brickyard 400. Who to watch for, who is tra tra tracking good, who's tracking bad. Let's do this. And for this segment, we're bringing back another sponsor to Out of the Groove. Theragesic is sponsoring this episode. They make a pain relieving cream, and I think there are a few drivers out there right now, right on that cut line, that might be needing some of this stuff if things don't go well in Indianapolis. They're going to be feeling the pain. It's not going to feel good for them if they miss the playoffs. So let's start this segment really quick by looking at the playoff grade, looking specifically at that playoff bubble. Clint Boyer, after a strong performance at Darlington this last weekend, finishing in the top 10, bumped his way all the way up into the 15th position, eight points to the good. Clint Boyer driving SHR equipment has got to be feeling pretty good. That was a very impressive, very clutch performance Saturday night, Sunday night. It was a Sunday night race, sorry. But then you have Daniel Suarez and Ryan Newman right there tied for the last playoff spot. Now Daniel Suarez owns the tiebreaker because he has the better individual finish in a race this year than Ryan Newman, but it is close. Young guy driving a really good car but still trying to figure things out versus the veteran who's really trying to bring that program back into relevance, trying to beat the odds and make the playoffs this year. Uh, it's a great story for both those guys right there. That's going to be a really interesting one to watch. But then below them, Jimmy Johnson, despite a really strong first half of the race at Darlington, collecting a lot of stage points, Jimmy was caught up in a wreck. That was not his fault, and that forced him to sacrifice some significant points. He had the potential, uh, the potential of being just a few points out of the playoffs coming into Indianapolis. Instead, he is still 18 points back. So really heartbreaking to see for Jimmy Johnson, seven-time champion. Uh, but he's still not out of it. He is not out of it. He has won the Brickyard 400 a few times, so he is not out of it by any means. Let's start with Clint Boyer here. Clint Boyer had a very good run at Darlington, which I hoped he would have. He's a veteran driver, and that's a track that's very challenging, typically favors veterans, uh, but that get, puts him in a very good spot. I think he's got to be feeling pretty good. Not great, 
but pretty good about where he's at right now. Now, Indianapolis is not as much of a driver track. It's more, you're more reliant on your equipment, but he's got pretty good equipment as well. He's driving for Stuart Haas Racing, one of the powerhouse teams in the sport. You'd hope that they put things together and can close the deal out at Indianapolis, but you never know. Things may not always go well for him. He's got a 14.1 career average finish here. Now, if we look at his results at some of the other big, fast, flat tracks this season, he has an 11th and a 5th place finish at the two Pocono races, but Michigan, Fontana uh, did not have great finishes this year. So that's a little concerning to me because if I was going to compare Indy to any track, it'd probably be those. And so that's a little concerning to me, but... I don't know, I think Clint Boyer, they hopefully have righted the ship after a really tough summer and can figure things out and close the deal out. Eight point cushion is pretty good. I wanna spend a little more time talking about the two guys right here on the cut line. We'll start with Daniel Suarez, zero points to the good, but he owns the tiebreaker for now. Daniel Suarez did everything he needed to do at Darlington last weekend. Last week I just said he needs to survive Darlington, a track that he'd never cracked the top 25 in. He just needed to survive Darlington. He did more than that, finished 11th, very solid. He came in two points to the good, he goes out zero points to the good, but that's pretty good. He maintained. And now in his two Indianapolis starts, uh, he's finished 7th and 18th, so not too bad, but Daniel Suarez has historically been really good at the fast flat racetracks, including this year. His numbers are pretty solid. He finished 4th and 5th at the two Michigan races this year. He finished 8th at the first Pocono race, 13th at Fontana. All those finishes, in my opinion, are good enough to make the playoffs on Sunday. If he can do that, I think he's going to make the playoffs. I think Suarez will be just fine. If he can hang out in the top 10, maybe get some stage points, or at least, at the very least, keep Ryan Newman from stage points, I think Daniel Suarez will be just fine. Uh, so that's why I said he just needed to survive Darlington, because Indianapolis is right up his alley. Anything can happen, obviously. Something bad could happen. But assuming he avoids any major trouble, I think Suarez will make the playoffs. Uh, he set himself up very nicely going into one of his better racetracks. So... Fingers crossed for Suarez, he can finally make the playoffs after two and a half years of trying, but we'll see. We'll have to wait and see. Not going to jump the gun. I, I don't trust Daniel Suarez fully yet, but he has put himself in a good spot. Let's talk about Ryan Newman. Zero points behind Daniel Suarez, so it's, it's a toss-up, really. Now, last year at Indianapolis, Ryan Newman actually finished 10th, and he was driving for RCR. At the time, RCR was not very good, so that is significant. I think RCR last year is similar to Roush this year, so if he finished 10th last year, Maybe he can get another top 10 in Roush equipment this year, so that's a reason to be optimistic for Newman. The problem is I don't see Ryan Newman collecting many stage points. That's not really been his MO this year. He just stays out of trouble and finishes 13th, and that's good enough for him. In this race, though, if Suarez is up in the top five getting stage points, if Boyer's up there getting stage points, Newman's going to have to get up there and get stage points as well. And I just don't think he's the guy to do that. He's more of a wait until the end and get there when it matters most, and that worked back in the day, but with stage points rewarding consistency throughout a race, doesn't quite fit Newman, especially not that six car quite as well. Now, Newman did win uh, at the Brickyard 400 in 2013, so he has had good success at this track in the past, so keep an eye on him. He's a veteran. He knows what he's doing. He's been in these positions before, and he's proven that he will do almost anything to make the playoffs or make the next round. And remember, he and Daniel Suarez had a little bit of a run-in at Darlington. Suarez got into Newman a little bit, spun him around. So if it comes down to Suarez, Newman, at the end of the day, Newman's going to do what he has to do to get by Daniel Suarez. He's not going to pull any punches, so that's a reason to maybe be on Newman's side here and think he has a good shot. I just don't think that six car is really fast enough to contend with the 41, uh, but we'll have to wait and see. We'll have to wait and see. Let's move on now to the fourth guy on this playoff grid, Jimmy Johnson. Jimmy put up a valiant effort at Darlington, but he's probably going to need some of this after Indianapolis because it's going to be, it's going to hurt. It's going to be painful when he does not make the playoffs for the first time in his illustrious career. It's going to hurt for me as a fan, as a guy who grew up his whole life watching Jimmy Johnson dominate Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Sunday. It's going to hurt not seeing that 48 car in the playoffs, but unless a miracle happens, unless they somehow win, which Hendrick cars have pulled off upsets at Indianapolis in recent years, Casey Kane 2017 pulled off an upset, unless something like that happens again here, I don't think Jimmy Johnson's going to make the playoffs. I don't think he's going to point his way in unless a huge wreck happens on lap one that takes out Boyer and Newman and Suarez. It's not happening for Jimmy Johnson. I just don't see it in the cards. I thought Darlington was the turnaround race. He ran in the top five the first half of the race, collected a bunch of important stage points, but then the 2019 Jimmy Johnson luck caught up, caught up with him, and he was caught up in that big wreck with Hemrick and Hamlin and others, and it's just not going on. It's not going well for Jimmy this year, and it hasn't all been him. It's been somewhat the car, the crew chief change, and turmoil and everything. It's been a little bit Jimmy. It's been bad luck as well. It's just sometimes you just have years like this, and it's been Jimmy's... It's been a bad year for Jimmy Johnson, and unless his luck shockingly turns around overnight, it's not happening. He's not making the playoffs. He's a four-time Brickyard 400 winner, though, so don't count him out entirely. Uh, he hasn't won, though, since 2012, so it's been a while. He has not won at, Indi at Indianapolis in the Gen 6 era, so 
keep that in mind. And if you look at his finishes at the other big, fast, flat tracks this year, he's not running in the top 10. He's finishing 15th, 18th at Michigan, at Pocono. So I just... I don't think the cars are going to be ready for him this week. I don't think he's really ready for it this week. And he's just too far back. If he was three points out, maybe. I'd give him a good shot. But 18, pretty much must win. And I don't know, that's a lot of pressure to put on a guy that hasn't really been able to sniff the lead for two years. Maybe that's harsh, I know. I just you know, have high expectations for Jimmy Johnson, seven-time champion. But they seem to be getting along with Cliff Daniels, his new crew chief. So maybe 2020, which could be Jimmy Johnson's final season in NASCAR, maybe that's just going to go out and be a glorious send-off. Maybe they figure it out and... You know, 2020. It's never too early to look ahead to 2020. Gosh, that sounds super condescending. He could still make the playoffs. He could still make the playoffs. I just don't think it's happening. I think he needs to focus his energy on next year because this year, I think it's going to be a wash. But again, these are just my opinions. We're not going to know what actually happens until Sunday evening, Sunday afternoon. So uh, anyway, thank you to Thera G Sick for sponsoring this episode. I've been doing a lot of traveling lately, you know, walking around Bristol. If you're going to a racetrack sometime soon, there's a lot of walking. It's often hot. You might need to relieve some of that pain in your joints or in your muscles. This stuff is perfect for you. Thera G Sick, huge, awesome shout out to them for sponsoring Out of the Group and sponsoring this segment. Stop the pain before it stops you. That is their slogan. You can find this at a ton of retail groceries and pharmacies. Walmart, Food City, H. HEB, Berkshire, all these types of places. You can even find it on Amazon.com. Order yourself a, a, a sample here. Really awesome to them for coming on, sponsoring out of the group, supporting NASCAR, supporting the show. Huge shout out to them, guys. They're a G sick. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode. I hope you enjoyed. Remember, you can follow me on Twitter, you can follow me on Instagram, all that great stuff. Continue the racing conversation over there. And of course, a big thank you to my Patreon supporters. Michael Harrison at Geos of the Stars, Cameron James, John Colbins, Jason R. Long, Wesley Donaldson, Isaac Dennison, Mika Suzuki, iFantasyRace.com, the Racing Insiders.com, Peppy Luscious, Matthew Kulopoulos, Jeremy Conkling, Joey DiMicino, Emilio Garcia, Sky Racing Forum, Bryce Schumacher, Bryce Starcher, Scott McNew, and the rest of these amazing Patreon supporters. I could do this with Without you guys, it's because of your support that I'm able to afford an office like this, a studio space uh, where I can continue to record this show and make hopefully each episode bigger and better than the last. Good things are coming. It's going to be an exciting end to 2019 and it wouldn't be possible without the support I get from all of you on Patreon. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Should have at least one more episode up this week before the Indianapolis race this weekend, so keep an eye out for that. There's a lot of news we have to catch up on from the last few days that I want to discuss, so going to be some exciting things. Thank you guys for watching. Hope you enjoyed. I'll see you again very, very soon. Bye-bye, everyone.